Every investigation is like a jigsaw, each piece offering new evidence as a picture of a suspect emerges. But which one will reveal the killer's mistake? A guy like Kent McGowan wants to kill you, he's going to kill you. He just managed to do it under the color of law. I guess this one. 911 County, what's your emergency? They are trying to break into my house, please. So Kent McGowan, he was charming. He was likable. He was obsessed with being popular. Uh, and who is Joseph Kent McGowan? Who are you? Who am I as a person? Well, an innocent man, that's for sure. This was his chance, his chance at being that super cop that he always wanted. Hold it, please. What are they doing? They just broke in, okay. I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. Ma'am? It looked like a clear case of self-defense. So to send Officer Kent McGowan to prison, investigators would have to uncover Old Oaks, Harris County, Houston. This road was the scene of a violent death. Homicide is not what you'd expect here. People are wealthy enough to pay for police cars to patrol the neighborhood. This way you have a fully certified Texas peace officer with full arrest powers that can conduct traffic stops, arrest people, and has the full authority to truly protect you in that neighborhood. It's an excellent concept. These are the guys driving around providing a visible police presence, particularly in a very affluent suburb like Old Oaks. Guys like Officer Kent McGowan. He sees himself as more than a patrol car policeman issuing tickets and keeping an eye on big houses. He is someone who has spent his life dressing to be an authority. He has ambitions. He wants to be a celebrated detective. We know Kent McGowan is a man who likes to wear a uniform. He was in the Air Force. When he leaves, he begins volunteering as a police officer. It's not often that the Texas Correctional Facility Authorities and the prisoners inside agree to a TV interview. Joseph Kent McGowan did, a career cop. This is not where he saw himself ending up. To be honest with you, when I was a little boy, I despised bullies, thieves, and liars. I always had, to, as a little kid, as, as, had this issue with bad guys. And I just kind of, that was the trail which life led me. And that's, that's, that's why I went to the Air Force when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, 17, because that was about the, um, the youngest place you could be a policeman. Officer McGowan's beat, Hold Oaks, not the sort of area which will yield him the opportunity to excel to be a hero cop. He has the S on his chest as if he's Superman, the cop's cop. Brian Harris spent decades as a top homicide detective in Texas. He knows how policing works and the level of experience that an officer is expected to have for each assignment. He was assigned what's called a contract, his beat, basically. Very quiet. Not much police action is going to take place there, but he is assigned there until he gets enough time on and seniority where he can put in for another assignment, whether it's investigations or to a more crime-ridden area, but that's the area where he's there patrolling. And there's not much crime that happens in that neighborhood. So little chance for Officer McGowan to make his name until the events of a humid weekend in Houston take unexpected turns. Deputy McGowan is patrolling this relatively quiet neighborhood, but at the same time, his ear is to the ground. He probably knows, okay, who are the little troublemakers? Who are the ones that get in trouble, et cetera? Officer McGowan pulls over a young man called Michael Schaefer. And so he makes a traffic stop and the kid is scared. 
the patrol officer senses an opportunity to get himself an informer. If Michael can tell McGowan something useful, he'll let him go. And he starts inquiring. I hear there's stolen guns going around. Michael, nervous, anxious to avoid getting in trouble with the police, offers to help the officer. Kent McGowan now has his informant. Every good officer needs an informant on the streets, even in leafy old oaks. So now you have Michael. He's just a kid, teenager, barely an adult in the laws of Texas. But what can Michael tell Officer McGowan as an informer? He feels pressured, so he go turns to his friend. Hey, do you know where I can get a gun? And Jason gets him a gun. Jason Aguilar, 17, is no stranger to trouble. Jason's no angel. He's not a choir boy. McGowan arrests Jason, and here's a story which then escalates what had been an arrest for a traffic misdemeanor into something completely different. Jason Aguilar told me when we were working, he said, hey, I can buy you a fully automatic laser sided Uzi for $3,000. And at the time, a bunch of automatic weapons were showing up in that area, some drive-bys and whatever. And he told me for three grand, he could sell me a fully automatic for some guys he knows. Officer McGowan's case is getting bigger. Jason is going to spend the night in a cell. Earlier, his mother, a lady called Susan White, had left this note. Call me if you need me. I love you. A mother's love was about to show itself. She heads to the police station. When she comes over there, she goes, I need to talk to my son, whatever. I say, hey, he's going to jail. He'll be able to call you in a few hours. She was clearly intoxicated. Officer McGowan wasn't about to negotiate. It looked to him like Jason could be part of a gun runner's ring providing Houston's underworld with Uzis. It's an opportunity for recognition and potential promotion. And it had fallen right into Officer McGowan's lap. What better way than to stand out to your supervisors, to stand out to the sheriff or whoever are your bosses than to be this super cop, this great cop, or even to the neighbors and the people you serve in that community, to be the one that's crushing crime, crime that they didn't even know existed in their neighborhood. He tells his colleagues, I've got evidence here of a gun cartel operating in this suburb. I'm going to crack it. The day after Kent McGowan had arrested Jason, there was a further sinister development. He hears that Susan White had threatened Michael in phone calls between her and Michael's mother. She starts saying, do you know Michael Schaefer? He's a snitch. Don't you know what happens to snitches? Don't you watch TV? In Houston, snitches get killed. Those are the exact words. She told me she's a freaking nut, is what she said. She's a nut. She's crazy. And then I said, I said, do you think that she's capable of killing your son or having your son killed? Yes, I do. And I said, we're going to go ahead and pick her up on a, on a retaliation warrant. She said, good, get her off the street. He interprets a general conversation as a specific threat and then goes from people can get killed to you can get killed. In McGowan's mind, he now felt certain that he should get an arrest warrant, and fast. My name is Jim Mount. I was formerly employed as an assistant district attorney in Harris County, Texas, and I was one of the prosecutors who was involved in getting a warrant for Deputy McGowan. I prepared an affidavit in support of an arrest warrant for Susan White's arrest on a retaliation case. So he met me about 3 o'clock in the morning uh, at a division of the DA's office called Intake. And he and I spoke, and based on what he told me, I prepared an affidavit that he swore to is true and correct. A traffic misdemeanor had escalated to a crime involving gun running, and even, according to McGowan, an underworld threat of retaliation. He was absolutely certain that Susan White presented uh, a danger, an actual danger, to the informant that had been used to buy what he said was an Uzi submachine gun. Officer McGowan had waited a long time for this moment. Taking down the head of a gun running ring which was flooding Houston with Uzi submachine guns. And who might be the leader of the gang? Someone superficially living the life of a homemaker in leafy old oaks, Susan White. A sale of one single handgun suddenly becomes a big gun running 
organized crime, mafia type scenario where the Don of the Mafia is a middle-aged housewife. Officer Kent McGowan was en route to the office of District Attorney Jim Mount. He wanted an arrest warrant for Susan White, who he said had threatened the life of her son's friend, Michael Schaefer, a snitch who'd caused son Jason to be picked up by police. Informants in Houston, she told Michael's mother, don't live long. The initial district attorneys are going to say, yes, we will help you write this affidavit because this person is so dangerous. We cannot have people retaliating against our witnesses. We're not going to allow that to happen in Harris County. He told me that Susan White uh, was a person who was going to support her son and knew what he was doing. And so uh, I guess in his mind, she was also part of this sale of this machine gun. Um, he, he never told me in great detail about why he thought she was such a bad person. It, it was sort of conclusory. She's a bad person. You know, she's somebody that we got to get. McGowan, a neighborhood patrol officer, wanted to be in at the arrest of the possible gun runner, Susan White a woman masquerading as Miss Middle America. So I went in after midnight, I'm talking about everything done. I went in, it was after midnight, I spoke to Jim Mount, and he said, yeah, and we, by the time we got the paperwork and all that done, it was know, like 3.30 or 4 o'clock. He was adamant that he wanted to arrest her himself. Uh, again, that's not unusual, uh, so it did, that in and of itself didn't make me think something was wrong because not only now does he have Jason, the gun runner, now he's gonna go after the big boss, the leader of this big gun running cartel that operates in an affluent neighborhood. And I just told him, look, you, you can't get it done tonight. You can't get it done tonight. You're gonna to have to get it done later. And, and he seemed to be chafed about that. He was a little upset about that. And he said he was gonna call his sergeant and then figure something out. But he was very, very clear that he was going to be the one to arrest her. This is the arrest warrant Officer McGowan needed. He arranges for two deputy sheriffs to accompany him to Amber Forest Drive, Old Oaks, home of Susan White and her son Jason, who was fast asleep upstairs. It's after midnight, August 25th. On arrival, he calls her to ask Susan to surrender. She makes no reply to him. She's already on the phone. She's called 911 to complain about people outside her door. 911 County, what's your emergency? Officer McGowan didn't know she was making the call. And so I'm out there on the scene. We're knocking on the door for 15 minutes out there. Who's there? He, accompanied by two colleagues, prepares for so-called dynamic entry, breaking down the door. I've always done dynamic entry, run a warrant to keep this from happening, keep somebody from flushing their drugs, you know, grabbing a gun, hiding or whatever. But I figured being this wealthy lady and with a neighbor, I didn't know I didn't know she was a nut. At police headquarters, the 911 call continues. Susan White has been transferred. Go ahead, ma'am. My name is Susan White. We have the transcript to clearly understand what Susan White said that night. She sounds confused. She was in a deep sleep when she heard men outside. The door gets kicked in. What are they doing? It's okay. It's okay. She's on the phone. She hangs up the phone. McGowan and two other officers rush in. McGowan later says he sees Susan White with a gun. I saw her go from right to left. So we had our weapons on, I look, and she's in the corner, she's holding the gun. And he opens the bedroom door to be confronted by this woman who's holding a gun and pointing right at him. Well, I came in, she had the, uh, the gun at waist level, and she never said a word, 
never. Didn't say she said nothing. She had a gun at waist level, and it's true. You, I mean, I was tunnel vision. I see the gun pointing right at me. This woman, Susan White, what he believes is the ringleader of a gun cartel, and she's pointing a gun straight at him. She was standing like this in the corner, and the, the bed was like the door was right here, and the door opened like this, and there was a on well, chest of drawers, the TV, and a converter box on it, if I recall. And Show then me I, what she looked like. Huh? Show me what she looked like. She was standing with a gun just like this. He fears his life is in danger and that his deputy's life is in danger. I saw her for maybe three seconds. I'm hollering at her three times, drop the gun, drop the gun. She doesn't. She continues to point it at him. I told her a second time, she kind of she kind of turned and pointed right at me with the proverbial Mexican standoff. I'm about 11 feet away, I think it was. You know, I told her a third time. When she did this, she had like this. She squared at me, and she pulls a gun like this, and then that's and then put her finger on the trigger. And that's what I told her a third time. So he fires. Believing his own life and that of his two deputies is in danger, Officer Kent McGowan fires three times at Susan White. First round struck her in the chest, and she started going like this. The second round was behind it and, hit, and went through the arm and stuck right in the chest. Another bullet hit her in the head. She was dead. Brian Harris has heard the recording of the incident picked up via the 911 call made by Susan White. What you hear on the tape, you hear the entry being made. How many is there? I don't know. Please. What are they doing? Just okay. He uses an old method of assessing how long it took to travel from banging down the door to the bedroom of Susan White. Six seconds. Please. What are they doing? 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006. Susan is dead. She's been shot. By who? Deputy McGowan. Now, Susan had six seconds to live from the point that the door got kicked in to the time that Deputy McGowan sees her in her bedroom. He's a hero. He's cracked a big case. It's been his ambition for years to do this. He's been telling people, one day I'm going to I'm going to break a really big case, and here he is. He's shot the leader of a gun cartel. She's dead. I did what I had to do to save my life, the life of Deputy Morong and Malloy at that moment. That's what I did. As far as Kent McGowan's concerned, he's done his job. He's a hero. Case closed. But McGowan had not told the whole truth. What was the killer's mistake yet to be uncovered? Today, the murder rate in Houston stands at around 250 a year. In the early 90s, it was nearly double that. A north side, south side gangland feud accounted for many of that number. The death of Susan White, now a suspect in gun running who had allegedly aimed a pistol at an officer, was not immediately big news. Officer Kent McGowan had done what he had to do, no more. Deputy McGowan, right after the shooting, is freely talking to other people about what he had to do, what he felt he had to do. He's creating this hero cop, how he saved his fellow deputies, how he saved his life, that it was this profile and courage of how he behaved, quote, under fire or potential of fire. He goes back to the police office. He's very proud of what he's done. He's boasting about it even. Officer McGowan's conscience was clear. Susan White had threatened to have one of his informants killed, an informant who had revealed that Susan's son Jason had sold him a gun, and according to Kent McGowan, Jason Aguilar had also revealed he could get an Uzi submachine gun for $3,000. Yeah, that's what they were telling me, yes. I didn't know Susan White, so I didn't know if she's a nut or not. I'm going by what my informant said. I couldn't question him on a serious situation like that. I talked to Michael, uh, Michael Schaefer a number of times that night, excuse me, <clears throat> and his mother, Jeannie Jakes. And they told me, yeah, that she's a nut. He was, that kid was terrified. He was calling me 911, 911 the whole time. But reading the statements given by colleagues, it's clear that the story does not add up. And Kent McGowan's post-shooting attitude was a concern too. 
At first, his colleagues are like, yeah, you've done a good thing, but they're like, you've just killed someone and it's a woman. That's not a normal reaction to, to killing someone, even if they were the ringleader of a gun cartel. That's a big red flag. As a homicide detective, and I've investigated numerous officer-involved shootings, uh, from officers being killed to officers being involved in shootings, I have never, ever in 21 years had an officer that actually bragged about what they did. I have always seen officers that are fairly quiet. We make sure they get some counseling, some psychological counseling. It's a traumatic event. It's not natural for a human being to take another human being's life. Kent McGowan, his actions after the shooting, the things he said, huge red flag. What's wrong with this guy? Some colleague officers reported another troubling detail of McGowan's post-incident behavior. He had asked for the casings of the bullets that he'd fired when the autopsy was complete. And then what he requests of the detectives, the trophy, he actually asks for the shell casings from his shooting scene so he can use them on display. Who would do such a thing? It's twisted. It's scary to think that you have a law enforcement officer that would be out on the street that would want to, almost as if it's a World War II ace where they put markings for every person they shot down. It's very disturbing as a fellow law enforcement officer that Kent McGowan would actually look at this as a trophy, the killing of a human being as a trophy. Most murders involve killers who know their victims. More often than not, they're over relationship issues or money. As detectives evaluate evidence, they speak of breakthrough moments, the realization from one fact which emerges that a killer has made a mistake. From the moment that the Kent McGowan began to brag about his exemplary behavior in protecting his fellow officers from the dangerous Susan White, his version of events began to unravel. Susan White was on nobody's radar as a gun runner. Apparently there's this big gun cartel in this affluent suburb of Houston. It's a woman. Um, she seems like a regular mum. Being that this neighborhood had little to no crime, most people would think is a great thing. But if you have a young officer that is trying to be this superhero, in their own mind, they can create a fantasy that's just not there. The kid at the corner street smoking a joint, that's a huge major drug trafficker attached to a cartel. Somebody is speeding, that's a possible stolen car for them. So they take what some would consider minor or nonviolent offenses and they really blow it up. Now if you take Kent McGowan's situation, you're talking about a sale of a gun, a handgun and a sale of one single handgun suddenly becomes a big gun running, organized crime, mafia type scenario. And then the reason McGowan had given for needing an arrest warrant began to crumble. Michael Schaefer's mother, Jeannie Jakes, 165 miles away in Austin, Texas, did confirm that the couple had spoken in general about the trouble that their sons had caused and that Michael might be better served not becoming a police informant. But this was not a heated conversation between adversaries. Jason's mom calls Michael's mom. No different than two kids who get in a fight in a schoolyard and parents are gonna to talk to each other. I take it as a, as a conversation in generalities, not a specific threat. So you have two grown women talking to each other and, and Jason's mom reaches out and says, you know what? What is Michael crazy getting mixed up with this guy? I mean, you know, in the real world, people can get hurt. People have even died from doing stuff like that. If, if Deputy McGowan had simply told me that Susan White made a phone call to someone in another city and said informants in Houston don't live long, that by itself would have been completely insufficient for me to draft a warrant for him. No judge would have signed it. No prosecutor would have accepted a charge against her. As for the suggestion that Uzi submachine guns were part of that night's story, it simply wasn't true. As Kent McGowan gave evidence to investigators replaying events for them to assess what had happened, something else emerged. 
McGowan knew Susan White before that night's events, and she knew him well enough to be frightened that he was outside the door. A transcript was prepared of what Susan White had said, and soon it was confirmed she and McGowan had history. Susan White says she first encountered Kent McGowan because he kept pulling her over for speeding tickets. She says what he was really doing was hitting on her. Perhaps McGowan felt that sort of behaviour was a perk of wearing the uniform. Kent McGowan is somebody that isn't going to sit real well with the term no. And so when he's out in that neighborhood, he's wearing that uniform. And there's a couple of things you need to remind yourself when you're a young cop. Are you really that good looking? Suddenly you're wearing that uniform, you have all kinds of ladies and people hitting on you. Go back in plain clothes, you're really probably not that good looking. And are you really that smart? People twice your age now are asking you, advice. You had not been on earth that long to be that wise, but that uniform brings a lot of that. But that also sometimes can give a false sense of confidence. And I believe Kent fell into that category. And he had this single, beautiful, good-looking lady. Certainly why would she spurn his advances? When she says no, that's maybe perhaps her way of flirting with him. So because Kent McGowan couldn't accept the word no, or didn't have enough common sense to see that she wasn't interested, he kept pursuing her and pursuing her. He pursued her often enough for her to mention her concerns to one of his senior officers and to urge the operator at the end of her 911 call that night to send help. Who's there? Okay, do you need a deputy out to your house? They are trying to break into my house, please! and she's scared. She believes this guy's gonna kill her. He has made unlawful entry into her home. What are they doing? They're just broken in, okay. All she knows in her head is Kent McGowan, and he's here to kill me. Ma'am? Just days after the shooting of Susan White in an apparent justifiable act of self-defense, Kent McGowan had become a murder suspect. There were anomalies in his story. He had claimed the involvement of an Uzi submachine gun in his inquiries. Not true. To get an arrest warrant, he had claimed Susan White had suggested his informant might get killed. That claim appeared fanciful at best. And a big mistake made in his version of events. He had not told the district attorney that Susan White knew McGowan and had complained about him harassing her. McGowan denies that he knew Susan White, though he accepts she may have known him. Well, you know what? Maybe she was stalking me. I've been asked that. What was true? Was Officer Joseph Kent McGowan a hero cop or a killer in a uniform? And if so, what was the mistake that would uncover him? Who was Kent McGowan? Investigators wanted to know more about their 27-year-old colleague. Kent McGowan, I would describe as a gypsy cop somebody who was a narcissist, uh, somebody who truly believes that they themselves are that superhero. McGowan kept losing his jobs. The records uncovered show a checkered career rap sheet. He gets a job as a police officer. Things don't go well in the police force. He's accused of sexual harassment. People say he has violent tendencies. He's a shirker, he, he's quite lazy actually, even though he says he wants, to, he wants to be a hero. He's heard making comments about women, disparaging comments about women. He loses his job as a police officer. 
He then volunteers to be a police officer. He loses that volunteer position. He volunteers again. He's desperate to keep on wearing that uniform and to keep having the power that that uniform provides. Kent McGowan has always refuted the claims made about him by officers who uncovered his career records. This is what he told us about the times he got fired, like when a complaint was made about him by a female officer. See, that's not true. That's what happened. Do you want me to go ahead and explain? Or when he was let go as a police volunteer after complaints from the public. See, that's not true either. So then you went to Precinct 4. Right. And you were fired there after two months. See, after that's a not civil true either. See, that's not true either. So you're saying the investigations against you at Houston Police Department, not true? No, there was, there was some minor investigations, that was it, and when, it was, I think, three of them. As for the sexual harassment claims, it was not just Susan White who'd leveled complaints against him. It was a former colleague, too. But McGowan maintains he was the victim. It was some female officer who was stalking me back then, and she was crazy. I told her she needs to back off, and you know, I talked to her after work. There are already questions about his attitudes towards women. He's previously been accused of sexual harassment. And here he is, shooting dead a woman who he has a history with. Who detectives believed was clear. They took McGowan's plausibility and charm as a cover-up for the truth. Some of the most violent killers I dealt with in 21 years of investigating homicides we're charming, we're so likable in that interview room. Uh, you wanted to like them, but I wasn't a fool. I knew that in a second they would kill me without even thinking twice. So Kent McGowan, he was charming, he was likable. He was obsessed with being popular, he was obsessed with being that super cop, and that's what made him so dangerous. He would do anything to portray himself as that superhero. Character evaluations are one thing. If a jury was to convict Kent McGowan as a killer rather than believe he's a cop acting in self-defense, detectives needed more. They began to forensically analyze McGowan's portrayal of what went on during the six seconds from when he entered 3407 Amber Forest Drive and when he shot Susan White. Well, I came in, she had the, uh, the gun at waist level and she never said a word, never. Didn't say, she said nothing. She had a gun at waist level, and it's true, you, I, mean, I was tunnel vision, I see the gun pointing right at me. McGowan said in evidence that Susan White was standing by her bed, facing him, square on, and holding a gun in her right hand. So I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. She was facing you, square on. Yeah, well, at first she was, yeah, she was like this. And she had it like this, pointing right at me. I said, I said, I said drop the gun, drop the gun. And when I said the second time, she comes up and she points the gun, we're at the proverbial Mexican standoff, and I saw the, she had the weapon index, her finger was not on the trigger. Her finger was not on the trigger at that point. And that's why I was watching the trigger. I knew if she, put the, if she touches the trigger, I'm going to have to shoot her. I told her, I said, I told her a third time. I see her put her finger on the trigger, and I hollered a third time, drop the gun. Well, I see her squeezing the trigger, and I fired three rounds, and she falls. But anyway, she, um, uh, she falls face down and then Morong went underneath me and jumped on top of her. Because we didn't know if she'd been hit or not. I mean, if the room's full of smoke, the alarm's going off, and I'm going to the radio calling for a supervisor and an ambulance. Well, first thing, we run up to her, and, um, and she was on her right, on the left side, and the gun was still in her right hand. The gun was still in Susan's right hand. There's a big problem for Officer McGowan at this point in his evidence. Susan was a lefty. I venture to say that Kent McGowan didn't know that. But Susan White was left-handed. Why would she be holding her gun in her right hand? And if you're lefty, you're going to have, if you were to follow Deputy McGowan's story, you would have the gun in your primary hand. For the most part, you would have it in your left hand. When you look at the angle of the bullets, the wounds on her body, it doesn't match the scenario of somebody holding a gun in their right hand. So right there, when you do the physical autopsy on someone, that also is a roadmap of what happened. So an autopsy is done on Susan and the angle of the bullet, the location of the wounds, they do not match whatsoever 
the scenario of Susan holding a gun in her right hand. The angle of the bullet and the location of Susan White's injuries did not support McGowan's statements. If she was standing square onto McGowan, his shots should have entered her body in a direct straight trajectory. When she had the gun, when she was standing there, she, when I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. As I told her, she goes like this, and, and when she pulls it up, when she does this, that, she had it like this, she just squared at me. And she pulls the gun like this, and then, that's, and then put her finger on the trigger, and that's what I told her a third time. If you listen to Deputy McGowan, they have guns pointed at each other. It's a standoff. He had to fire before she fired first, and the guns were leveled right directly at each other. However, Susan's wounds on her body, the wounds going from right to left, that's an indication she's turning. Maybe hanging up the phone, turning, what? Or whatever's happening, but she's in a turning motion. And the way the angles of the, of the wounds are, the way the angle of the bullet to her head is, that angle, that autopsy, that's a road map. When they do the bullet analysis, what they find is that the bullets, there's strong evidence the bullets entered the side of her face and the side of her body. That's completely at odds with what McGowan is saying. It is not consistent with the deputy's story that they were face to face, guns pointed directly at each other. You see, the wounds itself, that physical autopsy, totally disputes what Deputy McGowan states. District Attorney Jim Mount was part of the system that issued the arrest warrant, so allowing McGowan the chance to shoot dead Susan White. Now, what I believe happened is that I was giving him permission to go into her house and kill her. He is now certain that he would have found a way to kill her, with or without the cover of a warrant. Nevertheless, that night would have been different if Officer McGowan had not had this crucial piece of paper. Clearly, he wanted to be able to arrest her, to go into her house, have a legal basis to go into her house. And, and that's what I provided him uh, and, and what a judge provided him. Uh, that's, you know, that's why I say if, if, if a guy like Kent McGowan wants to kill you, he's going to kill you. He just managed to do it under the color of law. Did identify himself as police? Yes. Yeah. But that, they were, I was in my bedroom, my bedroom sleeping, and there was somebody, they were looking through my window. They, they said, this is the police. Who's breaking into your house? I don't know. They say they are detectives. I have been threatened by one of them. How many is there? I don't know. They please. What are they doing? They're just looking. Okay. Kent McGowan was his own worst enemy. Loose lips sink ships. He wanted to be that super cop, so he brags about what he does. He perhaps fabricates uh, in his own mind, creating this huge scenario of what took place in the shooting and the gun running, how he got this really bad person, and he's this super cop. The fact of the trophy bullets raised suspicion raise suspicion more than what an autopsy would do. So now you have an autopsy where the initial investigators are at the scene. They're observing his behavior. They hear about some of the comments he makes. Bells and whistles start going off. Now they look at the autopsy. They are comparing the trajectory of the bullets on Susan's body to the statement that Kent McGowan makes, which causes them to go back and look at the affidavit Wait a minute, this affidavit says a whole bunch of stuff and the scene is not telling us that. This is just a homeowner, perhaps with a gun in their own house like so many other Texans or Houstonians have. This is not some major gun runner. As a prosecutor, when you have police officers come into your office in the middle of the night and tell you, hey, I need you to write me an arrest warrant for someone, you have to believe what they tell you. You have to take it as the truth. Otherwise, the system grinds to a halt. So not knowing Deputy McGowan, I believed that he was going to tell me the truth, and I relied on what he told me. Turns out that it wasn't. McGowan was found guilty by a Texas jury. An appeal based on a technicality was granted, but he was found guilty again. But, you know, in retrospect, 
he got convicted twice. How can anyone think that he really is not guilty? I mean, seriously. So what was the key turning point that led to the charges of murder levelled against Kent McGowan? What was the killer's mistake? For Brian Harris, it was not a what, but a who. Kent McGowan himself. Kent McGowan's biggest mistake was thinking that he had the character and the ability to wear the badge on his chest. That man never should have been a law enforcement officer. With 2020 hindsight, it's pretty clear to me that this is a guy who probably should never have been a police officer, should never have been in a position to run an arrest warrant on someone who he apparently had a personal grudge against. When you wear that badge, you represent, that's why it's called a shield. It's a shield to protect others. It's a shield of honor. It's a shield of integrity. It's a shield of service. You take an oath to lay your life down for others, to serve other people. Kent McGowan's oath was to himself. He wore that badge to serve himself, to glorify himself. His biggest mistake was thinking he truly could be a police officer. He was a crook with a badge, is how I look at it. Kent McGowan was not given a mandatory life sentence. He is due for release in 2022. He still maintains his version of events that night it is true. I've got to go. I've got to go. I know you got to go, and I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm innocent. Get, get, Y'all don't want the truth. I'm not, the I'm truth. not done. I'm still working. Uh, I'm trusting you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, how do you... Look at this thing. Back here. 